today's watercolor tutorial. Once again, I'm starting off this video with some fine adjustments of my stand. I'd brought it into the uh, the living room the other day. That's where I do my oil painting, and um, I had tried to see if I could set it up to film my oil painting process, but I don't I don't think it's quite feasible for me to do it without catching the whole living room and all that. And I don't think everybody wants to see um, all that, you know, like a non-studio space. So I'm trying to figure out how to, uh, to film the oil painting process that I use and to kind of talk through and think through ideas as well. Anywho, so, um, welcome. Um, we have a quarter sheet of Stonehenge Aqua. I just tore the large sheet up a few moments ago. Uh, let's see. So today it's early morning and a Sunday currently while I'm painting this. I'm trying to think of what I want to do with it. And I think that I would like to have kind of little sub series within, um, these experiments. And there was an experiment that I alluded to in a previous video, which would be, um, excuse me, talking about the complementary combination, complementary color combination of um, sap green and Venetian red. This is one that I utilize um, in the oil painting, and it's one that I learned from uh, Stuart Davies and uh, Dennis uh, Sheehan, I believe that's how you pronounce his name, and then other people in the tonal style uh, modern tonos painters will um, will use that that mixture. Uh, reason being is, and if I misquote them or mess it up, I apologize. And and I use it for oils. Is that the you know the sap green? You'll have green in nature um, with trees and whatnot. Obviously, you mix it with. A Venetian red, light red, something like that. I think um, Stuart Davies uses red ochre. Um, I'm not sure what oil brand he uses, but you know, I tried finding a red ochre, but uh, red ochre is just it's a red earth tone. Um, you know, so light red, Venetian red, etc. So anyway, so you mix this with the sap green, you get a brown, and you'll have the reds within it um so yeah i'm going to use these complementary colors to do a watercolor painting and i'm going to push more towards the tonalist style with this i'm also going to probably use some oil approach to it as well with um the wiping and the swiping and the um blotting and the dabbing the way I would use it um, with an oil painting. I will probably wind up using other colors for the sky and whatnot. And, you know, so just know that that's going to take place in this painting. But we're going to try to get a lot of um, just our tonal mixtures from those two. Uh, while that's kind of just settling, just another thing, um, everybody usually has ultramarine and burnt sienna on their palette, and that's like a really common complementary color scheme. The ultramarine and, um, you know, the, the burnt sienna is kind of what the orange aspect of it, and you'll mix that and you can get a gray or dark. It's also fun because you can use the blue to cool down and the ultra, um, the burnt uh, sienna to, to bring things forward. So there's like a push back and forth taking place with that a combination. Um, 
other combinations that you can have and other ones that I'll probably talk about down the line uh, will be quinacron rose, quinacridone rose, and phthalo green. I believe I have that. I also have, um, I might have a dioxide purple and you know lemon yellow would be a good one. And like I said, this one is the most common and I think because ultramarine is just a very popular go-to blue while that earth tone is very common in um, palettes as well and beginner palettes. So I don't know if it was put on those palettes as a complimentary or just because of uh, just the convenience and where they sit within the whole art pigment spectrum. Anyhow, without further ado, let's do one last stretch of this. Um, the one thing that I'm going to keep in mind is that I'm going to have to keep this fairly wet uh, because, like I said, I'm going to be wiping and swiping and dabbing and going back in and out. Uh, and we're going to have to start with a different approach where I'm going to take the Venetian red and the sap green. I'm going to mix those two together. And we're going to get our brown. And I'm going to try not to mix it up perfectly so that we get variations in our brush stroke. Now, I'm just going to start. So this is wet and wet. Usually I start with my horizon line and whatnot. Here I'm going to start with uh, my shapes and my ideas. One thing that I would probably have benefited from would have been marking off um, where things would sit beneath the mat since this is a different approach than normal. But if you watch those oil painting videos, the, the two artists that I referred to earlier, it's more about throwing in the mass tones, the masses in the beginning. There's um, a lot of spontaneity to this approach and applying it to watercolor is a little difficult. I do have a general theme in mind. It's a, um, based off of an oil that I have that I painted and it's on my wall and I was just looking at it. I was doing a cleanup of the house, you know, it's almost springtime and I, you know, I need to clean up obviously when springtime occurs and I have frames around and canvases around and whatnot. So Eventually, it'd be nice to have like a place that's like a studio. So this is the Venetian red. This technique with the um, when used with oils, usually have that um, harsh bristle brush which helps scrape to give texture and a lot of people use a smooth or a um, sanded down gesso board and that allows the, um, the oil painter to wipe back to the white of the board. So these are my general shapes. Um, Let's see if we can mix some, well, before we mix darker concentrations, let's grab a paper towel so you can start seeing how we can do some shapes within this. And this is um, like trunk structure and whatnot. There's not much 
planning taking place. Like here, I, I have this tree structure and I'm gonna see the trunk. So I'm wiping out here. The wiping out at this stage with the wet and wet is a little awkward. You're not going to get like perfect straight lines and, and you don't want perfect straight lines. You want more organic, but it's necessary to use the paper towel here. And a lot of these things are like literally in the moment me learning it. Um, it's necessary to use the paper towel there because you're, um, if you were to scrape at this point, you would, um, you would just get those, those dark lines. It would just feed back into it. And I have a water bottle here. So that gets spritz back into it. And I could take a Q-tip. And in fact, I do have one from when I experimented with this a long time ago. Though, I don't think we'll get the desired effects from that. So there's that. Um, there's the fact that we can blob and start adding texture to it. And there's a push back and forth that is going to take place. And what I mean by that is here I'm putting a texture in it, right? Now, I'm going back to the palette, mixing up that Venetian red and the sap green. Um, I want a little bit of water in it, a little bit more. And now I'm coming back over it and I'm going to start losing those textures that I put in. But some textures will remain. So I had blotted the whole thing and I left just a little bit that had shown. And here I'm adding textures of the strokes here. I might um, use some Payne's Gray for some deep dark shadows and darks later on. And um, maybe a cerulean blue in the sky. And that's what I had meant earlier with um, maybe utilizing some other colors in here. This is, um, you know, so the tonalist style, uh, a very common um, I guess it's a, a common method now amongst tonalists uh, to paint in oils in this fashion. So, like I said, you know, it's an attempt to apply that to watercolor. And let's see. So we'll go right back to this. We might have to re-wet some areas twist the end of the sky and drag it. Um, I'm even catching down here with my paper towel, but that's fine. So we're essentially just, you know, building up layers of texture or hiding stuff where um, the best way to do it. And uh, this is what, uh, Mr. Uh, Davies says in his oil videos is, you know, you know, you're creating the illusion of texture. And that's um, very relatable to the Hake brush. You know, it's a fast and loose style where you're learning your tools and you're seeing what can take place. Like I'm going to put in a... Um, 
horizon line right back here. Kind of receive that back. Now, let's try to mix a darker concentration. And push the brush, attack with the brush, have fun and get textures with it. This area is very wet back here. And I keep on, every time I come back to it, I uh, have a little bit of issues, but. So, and I can bring out a little pathway and then I can come back over it. So it's kind of a um, very additive, subtractive process, which is very fun. Reminds me of when I had taken at, um, the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, UL. I'd taken a, um, they called it Drawing 3. And it was, you know, charcoal drawing from, um, you know, real life from, from uh, models. And we'd have our big old board of paper and in one hand we'd have um, charcoal and in the other hand an eraser. We're putting in, there's more cross hatching and shading and whatnot, but then we'd put it in and swipe it back with the, um, the eraser, put it in, swipe it back and it was building up of it. Now here we're starting to lose, I believe the ability to wipe out with the paper towel. So we may have to start scraping at this point. Yeah, see, we could get a really good scrape taking place. But it really jumps out in front. So this is where we have to build up another layer. So we're going to have to come back over this. So have fun with this. This is the time where, um, and you'll see it in a lot of Ron Ranson videos, you'll see it in in my videos and other people's videos where we'll talk about not knowing when to stop at the scraping. But because of that additive and subtractive process I keep talking about, we could probably just go bananas, just have a lot of fun with it. Because we're going to dab back over this and start, um, you know, pushing it back. The only negative, and this is what just came to mind, is that the quality of the paper. When we scrape, we do run um, health risks on the paper. You know, we're doing physical potential damage to the paper itself. Um, I'm not paper expert, but you know, it, here I have the 100% cotton, the parts are interwoven. As you wet it, it soaks up, it spreads out, um, the fibers change their position while it's wet. And, you know, one thing about overworking a painting is the potential to harm the paper to that point. But remember, we're experimenting and learning. Not every painting needs to be done to the point of where it's going to be, you know, a masterpiece and sold. I guess you could think of it this way. You have a few different currencies with art. There's, you know, the, obviously the physical selling of the art. There's the learning currency where you're learning from something, which um, is very important. So it has value in that aspect. There's also the, the pleasure aspect of just painting. 
So keep that in mind that um, I think that's that's the most important one, you know, to have that um, the pleasure um, painting. If you lose that, you probably lose a little bit of yourself, right? So there's a pleasure in painting. And there's also the, the joy that you get from um, family members and friends and their reactions to your paintings, if they enjoy it or not, you know. Now, let's blot. Unfortunately, my paper towel is getting quite damp. We do have this mess mashed one. Let's try. Let's see if we get some textures to pull from that. Oh yeah. And I believe, you know, what was it? JMW Turner. He utilized breadcrumbs, like dry bread to uh, soak up and dot. Another common tool is a sponge though I have sponges and I have one right here but I just I've never used it I'm just that's that should be a video in and of itself one day I think my timidness with the sponges and not having not done one is the drying and the cleaning that would take place I'm not I'm not too sure I'm gonna switch over to the rigger. So remember this was sap green and Venetian red. You could do this with sap green and um, a light red. You could probably do it with sap green um, and maybe even like the burnt sienna uh, viridian I'm not sure what you'd want to work with with that viridian has that more um, fallow type feel to it so maybe that's where you would go with the uh, quinacridone quindacron pigments and same thing with the thalo green the Elysian Crimson U would probably work with those then as well. But you will get a different feel. This is to kind of get the um, feel of the old masters um, and the pigments that they had. I think they had Terra Verte was their green. So I'm putting some darks in um, of this mixture. I'm still within those two um, original pigments that we worked with. We'll probably do a light wash in the sky. find that lately and you might have seen it if you've been following the progression of my videos is that I've been relying more and more on the back of my brush for scraping literally because of that short it's like I guess a nanosecond difference between grabbing a card and scraping So it kind of mimics the underpaintings that um, take place in oil painting. Um, 
I'm not sure what the 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 art term is for it. I don't know if it's the Grisalia. What would be interesting is to do this and then come back over it with um, with gouache. Like do an underpainting in this style. And then do the gouache over it, treating it like an oil paint on the second layer. And this is literally for the purpose of just getting a texture. With water, I like to think about how we have to do with more swiping. Um, composition wise, I want to bring this around. I'm probably I'll put some darks in there, yeah. Do a scraper too. Now, unfortunately, I have not been able to achieve like a dark dark with this mixture. And the reason I want that dark dark for some of those under parts of the trees maybe oh i hope i didn't accidentally catch some black on my so this is just a higher concentration it's going to be darker at the base and then come right back in and clean this brush off we put it through a lot and I want to clean it up I think I had said we wanted to do a little bit of blue in the sky um, I want to keep it kind of light and toned down I think I might go with um, well I have to go with something, so whatever I pick up, I have a little bit of cerulean. And there we go. So it's kind of just putting it on as a wash. I'm doing a little bit more 
pick one with this, then I should be, but... Lift out. Stand up and take a look and see how the whole thing's looking. So, Let's chance a little bit of Payne's Gray. But we're not gonna go overboard with it. Meaning, just to accentuate a few spots. And to get everything to mesh, I'm going to still dab with it. I really like the way this structure came right out right here. I wish that it was a little bit higher up in the picture. Then I think that we might have to call this one done. Um, I'll tell you what, that that was a really fun painting. So um, I encourage you to give it a try and experiment. It was definitely a change from my normal style, um, my normal approach. Um, so you can just then play around with it and then build things up. You can do more washes on top as it dries. Um, I would like to see if we can Actually, where is that? Where is that piece that I had? Okay, let's get a little bit of water on the end of this guy. This is our magic eraser. sunset there we go all right so we'll dry it and we'll sign it and we'll take a picture
I am very pleased with how this came out. Um, just, you know, looking at it as I had dried it off, it just, um, I really like sepia and sepia tone and, um, I have just never been able to, um, do it or utilize it or, um, you know, I, I have the paint, but I think like, you know, the old style sepia, which was originally made from the ink of, um, the cuttlefish. It, uh, and they would use it in drawing and writing and whatnot. It was just really beautiful. And, um, yeah, I feel like this has given us that tone a little bit of that old style of the old masters. So I hope you enjoyed. Um, that was, that was really fun. Um, I'm definitely going to do some more of this and it's good to have a, another approach in your bag of tricks. So, um, oh yeah, a whole bunch of links down below. Feel free to, um, check out the things out. I have a Patreon account. Um, I have the, uh, Etsy and all this other fun stuff for y'all to check out. All right. Have a great day.